Guys, after more than three years, they're finally here. Inside this box are my brand new Commodore keycaps. Now before I get to opening the package, let's take a look back at the long and convoluted journey this crowdfunded project has been on since its inception. The Indiegogo campaign for new Commodore VIC-20 and 64 keycaps was started by Jim Drew of cbmstuff.com back in December of 2019. Over the years, many brand new replacement parts have been created for these machines, including circuit boards, chips, and keyboards, but never keycaps. Not as critical as a SID chip to be sure, but one or more keys can often be found missing or broken on rescued systems. With brand new cases and a multitude of colors to choose from, many enthusiasts also wanted something other than the old, yellowed keys for their custom builds. It's important not to confuse this project with a 2015 campaign by a different group that collected $48,000 from backers, but to date has not delivered a product. Despite being burned once before, support for this new campaign was overwhelming. The initial goal of $45,000 was quickly reached in less than two weeks, followed by all of the stretch goals. In fact, new stretch goals had to be created using feedback from supporters just to keep up with demand. By the time the campaign ended, all of the goals had been met and the project was funded at 212%. Over 2,000 sets of keycaps were backed, with a staggering 80% going to Germany alone. Looking at the original timeline, the campaign was set to end on January 17th of 2020, with shipping to backers planned by May of the same year. Of course, with a global pandemic about to take center stage, things were going to get rocky. Looking back, despite the many, many setbacks and 139 campaign updates, the project was relentlessly driven forward to completion by Jim and a handful of other contributors that we'll talk about later. Before they made calculators, Commodore manufactured and sold typewriters. This prior experience with keyboard design gave them existing knowledge of ergonomics that would find its way into their home computers. For reference, the VIC-20 and C64 keyboard has four rows with 10 unique key shapes. The keys themselves are far from a simple square in design. Each row has a different profile from the next, and keys have a unique concave shape instead of a flat surface. To reproduce these shapes correctly required getting the models exactly right. Prior to this campaign, Jim had no experience with keycaps but had worked with plastic injection companies in the past. To get the shapes of each key right, he used a high precision 3D scanner, scanning each of the 10 different key shapes 25 times in four different orientations. The data was then stitched together to build a mesh. The mesh was cleaned up and a new 3D model was constructed using the scan data as a reference. So this is the actual um, 3D model that is, <laughs> it's actually correct. And okay. so yeah. you'll see this is how much variation there is in the Commodore keycap itself. Right. So if you build something that's fully symmetrical, yeah, uh, you know, so that you're building with, you know, with an actual CAD program, yeah. you can see these, like this section here, um, this is off. Yeah, and it's so, off. And, yeah. And, 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 and the result of either the mold or the, the, the design methodology. The used tooling or, we're wearing or, out or whatever the cause for it, it's yeah. off. So yeah. if we go ahead and we uh, hide this part, we end up with this. And right. uh, this is actually hollow because I don't have the top and this one put in. But so this ends up being fully symmetrical. So realistically, the key caps that I've produced now, um, yeah. these are actually better than what Commodore yeah, had as, done. As, as they as... would have been intended, would they have had the right? Oh, absolutely. The same tools. Uh, yep. If you want. yep, absolutely. After the models were designed, a resin prototype was 3D printed to test fitment. These steps were all completed prior to the start of the Indiegogo campaign to validate the feasibility of the project. Prototyping on an inexpensive 3D printer also greatly reduced costs, as issues could be identified and corrected without committing to having real molds made. One of the stretch goals was to have printing on the top face for letters and the front face for Petsky characters, just like the original bread bins. Later 64Cs cut costs by having everything printed only on the top face. 
Of course, before any printing could happen, the original font needed to be replicated. Jim reached out to some old Commodore employees to determine what typeface was originally used, but nothing was found that was an exact match. Instead, original keys were scanned, the images cleaned up, and the results were converted into a vector format with accompanying height and width dimensions. The finished product was compared to previous work done independently by both Dan Toodle and Keith Green, and after hundreds of hours spent on this aspect of the project alone, the typeface was complete and was accurate enough to pass for the real thing. Over the years, Commodore changed the keyboard design multiple times. These changes included different spring and plunger assemblies with incompatible key stems. The length of the stems also varied between 3.5 mm and 5 mm, and the tangs that lock the keys into place have different spacings. Even the placement of text and symbols moved around from version to version. Bottom line, keycaps from different Commodore keyboards were not always interchangeable. This fact was discovered late in the campaign and required the models to be redesigned such that the keycap receptacles would fit universally with all Commodore keyboard stems. On a standard 64 keyboard, it has a what we call the five millimeter plunger. So that okay. means from the base of this to the top of this is five yeah. millimeters. Okay. And for Commodore, for whatever reason, and I'm guessing it's because they wanted to cut corners. Yeah. They made a three and a half millimeter plunger. Oh, goodness. And so you can right away see the difference here. Yeah. Uh, that's how much taller that one is. Yeah. It also is a different location for the tang that holds the keycap in. Oh, my goodness. Which also means that the short plunger are not compatible with the long plunger keycaps, period. Right. So if you notice there's four sides of this on the plus right. mark, okay? Right. And each side has a, a tang that yeah. the holes in the lock. Right. Um, what I ended up doing was splitting them. And so if you take a look at this. Oh, here you can see it view, immediately. Yeah. So you see the height difference? Yeah. Yeah. So what They're I'm doing with a little bit different. Yeah. So I, each side has the taller for the five millimeter and each side yeah. has a lower for the three and a half. Got it. And so this locks, it's not a great lock. I mean, it holds the keycap in place. It's not going to come right. apart or anything. Right. Um, it locks in place, but it's kind of funny. It's not the definite snap that you get from the right. other one, but it's a, like a little bit of a clunk and it holds in yeah. place. And I've got keyboards that I've had keycaps on for a year and a half. Yeah, like a that. lot longer so, than you had wished for. Yeah, for, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Once the designs were set, a keyboard simulator was created by Vince Valenti to help campaign backers decide on which color combinations they wanted to use. It allowed users to select between different case styles and key layouts using the various colors that were offered as stretch goals. Dan Toodle was also instrumental in the campaign, providing not only his 3D models and fonts for validation, but also generating all the 3D rendered images that were used during the campaign. By the time funding was secured in January 2020, a manufacturer in China had been selected, one that already specialized in gaming keyboards. US companies had been considered as well, but given the low volume of this niche product, the costs would have been astronomically higher. Just at this moment in time, Lunar New Year was being celebrated, so the factory was closed. The already long holiday break had been extended even further with the hopes of containing the first wave of the coronavirus outbreak. Two weeks later, the quarantine continued and the factory was still offline. Other options were considered, but nothing was found that could match the cost. Some concern was expressed that the project would be nearly three weeks behind schedule because of the virus. Oh, how naive we were. As COVID-19 swept across the globe, more and more factories started closing down. Others, such as the ones selected to make the keycaps, were fully repurposed by the government to make personal protective equipment, or PPE. It was now May, the expected delivery date of the product to backers, and no factory was even available to begin the tooling process. By Christmas, the original company was no longer listed. Speculation was that they had been completely taken over by the government. Jim had been reaching out to other injection molding companies for quotes and evaluating samples. After many hours over many days emailing and video chatting overseas, a quote was selected and a contract signed. Things were starting to look up for 2021. 
Now April, weeks had been spent resolving the issue of the different keyboard versions having different stem fitment that we discussed earlier. The models were finalized and tooling for the molds was completed. Spring turned to summer, summer turned to fall. The first test run was of a single F3 key. The tolerances were found to be too tight, making installation difficult and completely crushing the tangs that hold the keycap to the stem. Without a proper lock, the key could just pop off on their own after multiple insertions and removals. This necessitated further updates to the models and tooling. Shortly thereafter, the company contracted to do the work stated that they were now refusing to do UV printing, the tooling for which had already been paid for as part of the original contract. Instead, they wanted to do pad printing, a process where the results may not be as durable. This video made by the factory demonstrates the first sample print and has incorrect font size and spacing. Once the font issues were resolved, another test run of keycaps was created. Unfortunately, now they had alignment issues. You can see here how the printing is askew. By November of 2021, a full set of keycaps had been created and the printing was looking good. But upon closer inspection, some of the corrections that had been previously implemented by the factory had again gone missing. Take a look at an original breadbin key in the center. See how tall the exclamation point is? Now look at the latest set from the factory. It's all squished. The font data provided to the company already takes into account the concavity of the key surface and stretches the font appropriately, so the problem had to be something else. The factory claimed it was too expensive to fix, even though they knew about the issue long ago and had fixed it in prior samples. Two years have now passed since the campaign launched. In attempting to fix the problem, four more full sets of keycaps were run. Each one was wrong, each in a different way. Some text was too large, some too small, and some was misaligned. None of this would have been a problem if the digital UV printing process had been used. At this point, the company wanted to farm out the printing work to someone else and only produce the plastic in direct breach of contract. More phone calls, more test prints, six of the 10 colors ended up being wrong. More misalignment issues, and the factory was now closed for Chinese New Year. By May 2022, keycaps were being produced at the factory for all of the colors selected by backers. By August, printing of each of the 350,000 individual pieces had been completed. The colors were right, the font was correct, the alignment was good, or was it? Every single one of the pound symbols turned out to be bad, and the factory admitted to making the final fixture with the text shifted incorrectly. It had been correct in prior runs, so they hadn't double-checked it against the original keyboards they had been sent for this purpose. A month later, all of the bad pound keys had been reprinted. It was learned later that each piece was being printed by hand one at a time. The factory didn't create a stamp. Instead, they used 200 different stencils for the top and front faces and inked them individually, despite money having been paid for them to create a fixture, which would allow them to print entire rows at a time. By December, backers were starting to receive their keycaps. Three years had passed since the campaign was first launched. The product quality was reported to be very good, but a few small issues were reported of missing keys, printing errors including misalignments and missing text, and even one key that was printed on a part from the wrong row. The factory has taken responsibility and is making replacements for any bad part that was received. And that brings us to today. Hopefully now you have a better appreciation for everything that went into bringing these new parts from concept to reality. But enough backstory, let's see what we've got here. So what I backed were two sets of keycaps and the colors I chose were translucent blue and translucent red. And also uh, keycap backers got a bonus of another set of function keys in any color they want. So I chose these translucent gray function keys 
just to see if they would mix and match with the red and blue. So I think these are gonna look really good on the Plasti Dipped Blue 64 that I've got. And I think these are gonna look really good on the transparent case that houses the Evo 64 from the last episode. So let me get to pulling off the old keycaps now. So here, once again, is my Plasti Dipped Blue Bread Bin. This is a removable temporary coating. And I think that these red keycaps are gonna look absolutely fantastic with that blue. First impressions, they seem to be sturdy. They seem to be really well built. They have a nice texture to them, a nice feel. The printing looks really good. So I'm excited to get these installed. All right, I've got the keyboard here and I'm ready to remove the keycaps. Something I did want to mention though, before you go ahead and do this on your own keyboard, is that Commodore really did not design these keyboards to be serviced. They, it was not their intention that you would be removing these keycaps to service them. The tangs on the key stem that lock into the little plus shape here on the keycap itself, they can deform once they're installed for the first time. And when you remove the key, they can either bend or break off entirely. And if that happens, then when you reinstall keys, they won't sit as well. They won't lock into place as well as they used to. And you may have to use some super glue. Uh, so just be aware that when you do remove keycaps from your Commodore keyboard, it is sort of a one-way trip and uh, your mileage may vary. All right, we're ready to install. I wanted to mention one other thing, and that was about the key stems. Of course, these keys are universal and they will fit both types of Commodore key stems, the short ones and the long ones. But because of the way the tangs are positioned, they are only going to be two points of engagement with each type of keyboard instead of the usual four. That's a compromise that was made so that the keys would work universally. It's just something to be aware of. They may not lock in as tightly as you're used to with original keys, but they should still be fine. So let's get this thing started. Now we have a decision to make. The original Commodore symbol, the trademark of which is still kind of up in the air and it wasn't able to be used for this keyboard campaign. Um, so the makers of the C64 reached out and they allowed Jim to use their 64 symbol here. So we have that option for the Commodore key. Uh, alternatively, we have a blank key that we can use there if we wanna use a blank key or to do some sort of graphic on that ourselves but I'm going to use the 64 key myself for now and see how that works. All right, so there's the finished product. What do you guys think? I know that's gonna be polarizing. Some people like the original look and there are plenty of other colors to choose from, but I think that's a pretty sharp look. The red looks really good with the blue there and the keys look really good. They're, the fitment is good, the printing is good. They feel really nice, really firm and solid. So I'm really happy with how that came out. That looks really good to me. And of course you can mix and match to your heart's content. So let your creativity be your guide. And here's the Evo 64 with the transparent case and the opposite keys installed. Yeah, the jury's still out a little bit here. I may experiment with different combinations of colors for the control keys or swap them back. I'm not sure yet, but the nice thing is, is that we have lots of options to choose from now. Case in point, I wasn't sure I wanted to keep these gray keycaps here for the F keys, so I swapped them back to the red ones to match the rest of the control keys. I think that looks better on the Evo. But honestly, I'm not even married to the split colors between the red and blue. I may just go solid blue across the board with 
red function keys. I think that might be the, the solution for this one. Yeah, I think I like the blue for all of the keys and then the red function keys with the translucent case here. And then for the bread bin, I've gone all back to red keys with the gray keycaps. Now, this might be too much color and I may actually change this out for something a little more understated, but that's the great thing is we have options and I can play around with it in the future. Once all the Indiegogo backers receive their orders, the keycaps will be available for the general public to purchase at cbmstuff.com. See the link in the description. It's easy to overlook just how much effort went into making these little pieces of plastic. Hopefully this video will help you to appreciate all the hard work involved in taking this project from concept to reality. So there we have it. After three years and thousands of hours, the Commodore keycap campaign was a success. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.